Morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? I'm Lisa O'Connor. I'm Dean of the Quinnipiac School of Nursing. Um, as you all know, I'm, I'm joined today by Associate Dean Lisa Rabeshi and Patty Gettings, who is our Director of Business uh, Operations and Administration. Um, Patty will be um, managing some behind the scenes technical and has some instructions before we get started. Patty? Yes, welcome everybody. Um, I'm glad you're here with us today. As Lisa mentioned, I'm going to be the technical host for today's event. Um, the first portion will be Lisa and Lisa giving you a brief update on the School of Nursing and letting us know about the, letting you know about the new initiatives for the School of Nursing. I will be handling the second portion, which will be the Q&A. If you have a question anywhere along the way, please place that question in the chat and we'll get to it when we get to the Q&A portion. If there happens to be a question that is of importance to you as well and, it, and you want to hear the answer for that, feel free to hover over that question and give it a thumbs up and that will bring it to the top of the, um, the chat. That's it. Enjoy. Okay. Well, again, um, thank you all for joining us and um, welcome for to another um, portion of Parent and Family Weekend. Um, I, I'd like to start with um, having our um, Associate Dean Lisa Rabeshi talk to you about some updates from the school and some new and exciting things that are happening. Lisa? Thank you very much, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to uh, work with your um, children and have the opportunity for them to be with us at Quinnipiac for their nursing education. And um, I wanted to start by providing the group with some updates from the School of Nursing as uh, we're now just past the midpoint of the fall semester. So um, just to begin, our enrollments are uh, quite robust. We have a little over 1,100 students enrolled within the School of Nursing. Uh, in addition to our traditional BSN program, we do offer nine other degree programs at both the undergraduate and graduate levels within the school. But our traditional program is the largest. It represents approximately 62% of our enrollments this semester. Some demographics that you might be interested in include that 12% of our total population is male and 14% of the population are from underrepresented groups. This semester, we have 24 doctorally prepared full-time faculty and 10 full-time administrators and staff. In addition, we have two distinguished practitioners and residents who teach in our nurse anesthesia doctoral program. And finally, we have a total of 94 part-time faculty this semester who primarily teach in our clinical and laboratory courses. This cadre of clinical experts is a key component within the School of Nursing. As deans, we're also um, very excited to update you on some new initiatives within the school. Uh, many of you have seen our extensive simulation resources on the North Haven campus. Simulation is well infused within our curriculum and continues to play a major role in the student's educational experience. Over the past year, we've been completing a self-study to be submitted this semester for accreditation of our simulation program by the Society for Simulation in Healthcare. Accreditation is voluntary and involves a peer-reviewed process but we strongly feel it's a way for us to demonstrate our excellence. As a parallel, over this past year, our simulation staff within the School of Nursing, as well as the School of Health Sciences and School of Medicine, who we closely collaborate with um, within the Simulation Center, have demonstrated their excellence. All have received the credential of Certified Healthcare Simulation Educator, known as CHESI certification. And that is also from the Society for Simulation in Healthcare. The School of Nursing um, has produced our very first view book. This magazine type publication highlights many of the activities within the School of Nursing and it's currently in press. We look forward to your seeing it very soon. It represents the excellence of our students, our alumni, our faculty and staff, and we couldn't be any more proud to share this within our own community and within the broader nursing community very soon. 
The faculty and staff in the School of Nursing remain highly engaged as professionals, and I want to just share um, some examples with you. The Dean's team, uh, consisting of Dean O'Connor, Assistant Dean Fisher, and myself, serve as members of the Connecticut League for Nursing Deans and Directors group. This group of Connecticut deans and directors meets and collaborates regularly to discuss issues of concern across nursing education. Our work was recognized this summer by the Connecticut League for Nursing as, as the group was presented with the President's Award at the CLN annual meeting. And this was in recognition of our collaborative work with the State Board of Nursing during the spring, addressing the clinical learning needs of students during the pandemic. I'm proud to let you know that despite all of the challenges posed in the spring by COVID-19, our students were able to meet the educational requirements by the state and our accreditor for program completion and thus all graduated on time. Beginning this summer, I have also assumed the role of the president of the Connecticut League for Nursing. And we have several of our faculty from the School of Nursing on the CLN Board of Directors. QU is represented very well at the state level. I'm also um, happy to share with you that our very own professor Nicholas Nicholson has received the Virginia Henderson Award for outstanding contributions to nursing research by the Connecticut Nurses Association. As a scholar, Professor Nicholson's research on social isolation in older adults continues to have a great impact and has received much attention within the media and within organizations such as AARP. We have um, also launched a couple of new courses I wanted to mention this morning. Um, the first is a course titled Navigating Telehealth. This course was designed to meet the educational needs for healthcare professionals who are now delivering digital healthcare at a much higher level of utilization. The second course is titled Principles of Aging. And um, I'm also really very excited to share with you some examples of the types of activities that nursing students have been engaged in this semester. Uh, we continue to be very proud of all of our students and all of their efforts as early professionals. A number of students across Quinnipiac University, including those from the School of Nursing, are serving as health ambassadors. These students are highly engaged in all of the health and safety initiatives that QU has taken to keep our campus safe during the pandemic. As another example, nursing students, along with faculty and staff, regularly volunteer to assist with our on-campus COVID testing. And I uh, thank you for sharing that, these pictures uh, with us, um, Patty, as well. Other students have volunteered to deliver meals to students who are in quarantine on campus. These initiatives are critically important for us to remain on campus this semester. And we are um, very thankful for all of the students' efforts in this area. Most recently, a group of students um, got together. Um, I believe it was about um, last weekend. Um, and they got together to make fleece blankets, which were donated yesterday to the New Reach Shelter in New Haven. And finally, nursing students are working, um, continuing to work very hard, planning charitable, charitable events, such as our Qthon. Um, that's a year long um, uh, fundraising designed to raise funds and awareness in support of the Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Over the past eight years, cumulative giving from Qthon has equated to more than a million dollars in donations. And our students are on the front lines of some of that philanthropy and um, that work is very much appreciated. 
So um, the goal was to give you just a, a little bit of a glimpse about what students are doing. And you probably know some of this through uh, your own children and what they have told you. Um, but I hope that's helpful. And again, um, as we uh, finish our presentation, would be very happy to take any questions that you might have uh, for us around this. Lisa? Unmuted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, we apologize in advance for any technical glitches that we may have along the way today. Um, thank you, Lisa, for those important points. Um, we have, I guess to say, in spite of COVID, so much goodness happening among our students and our community. Uh, we'd like to share a little bit more with you. So um, as we have met the challenges of COVID and kind of paused to keep all our students in line with their curriculum and continuing on with their um, clinical work and lab work, we have, of course, kept an eye on our strategic plan in the School of Nursing, and I'd like to share a little bit with you about our strategic plan. We have six primary categories for our strategic plan. Um, the first is community engagement, and that is much of what Lisa has just described, um, Associate Dean Rabeshi, in all that our students and our, our faculty and staff are doing in terms of giving back to the community, to our own campus, to our fellow students and colleagues, to the North Haven and Hamden communities and a little bit beyond. So um, that is kind of ingrained in who we are um, as the nursing community, but we're seeing some, some great things there um, and it's helping us achieve our strategic plan really about community engagement and giving back. An additional category of our strategic plan is curriculum um, and educational innovation. And that, of course, um, to Lisa's point with simulation is just one area. We're not just using simulation as a method for curriculum. We're getting creative with it, how we evaluate students, how we allow them to maybe even be a little uncomfortable and make mistakes in a safe environment, how we debrief and pre-brief, I should have that in the opposite order, pre-brief and debrief, and talk to them about what it felt like being in those situations, using technology, but not forgetting the humanness that is part of, of simulation is just one example of our curriculum innovation. We're really striving for creativity and high impact practices. Another example, and uh, our colleague Erica Mum was just on um, the news, I think it was Friday, Thursday, Thursday or Friday evening. Uh, we have uh, with Health 360, which um, is an aggregate of folks working together to help seniors at senior centers feel engaged, not feel isolated, um, being checked in on, making sure they're okay. And our professor, Erica Mum, has first started with a few students over the summer, and it's really positively snowballed with over 50 students participating this semester as part of their community health initiatives to work with seniors and to build a relationship and talk with them and see what their needs are, making sure they're safe through COVID, making sure they're not isolated. Those are things that are happening kind of on the fly, but with very deep meaning and planning. So that is just another example of some of our um, curriculum innovation. And we have, we, have, we have faculty who have ideas that may seem originally to be very far-fetched when in fact they come to fruition. We've got some collaborations happening with the School of Engineering and, and, and applications to do uh, documentation during codes or cardiac arrest situations. Uh, we have a lot of exciting things going on um, related to our curriculum. And students uh, have some great ideas that we're pulling in and making it part of the strategic initiative that we call curriculum innovation. Alumni engagement is our third, and these are not in any particular order, um, but it helps me remember them this way. Um, our alumni are, are quite strong and we have been very engaged with them the last six months in particularly with COVID. It was a reason to just do an extra special check in with them and reach out. And they have been very engaged with us, um, thanking us for their, for their education and wanting to give back to our nursing education community, wanting to come back and be part of interviewing, helping students learn how to do their resume and getting ready for their job, transitioning to their job, doing guest lecturing. They really wanna be part of the Bobcat community that they were so proud, um, 
proud to be in, um, and now, of course, our graduates. And these alums are doing great things. Some are running their own practices, their own business. Some are at the bedside. Some are, are advanced practice nurses now, nurse practitioners and nurse anesthetists um, in research. And some are educating and, and doing um, great things all around. And we're very proud of them. And it's important when we talk about that community that our alums are, are so strong, so strongly involved, even in our day-to-day our day-to-day -day activities. So that is another piece of our strategic plan. Partnership development is a bit more complex, but also an important part of our plan. And our partnerships, of course, um, begin with our clinical partners. We have very strong clinical partners across Connecticut, and some are the obvious healthcare systems. And then there are those that are community-based um, in the school systems, in, in clinics, community health clinics, in corporations, um, the list goes on. Um, and that is important for us to, um, one, spread the good word about Quinnipiac nursing, but see what we can do with our curriculum, with our strengths to help in their, in their um, industries and how we can give back to them. So a lot going there with partnership development. And prominence is, is really where we ultimately want to get to. And Lisa mentioned our, our simulation accreditation which is just one piece that kind of helps us put a head above the rest and, and become more prominent. Certainly our outcomes make us prominent, our strong graduation rates, our NCLEX pass rates, our quality, our high quality of applicants that we have into the program and the list continues. Um, but our most um, important and priority um, strategic plan is currently surrounding diversity and inclusivity. And we know that the university has an action plan to, to address this, as does now the School of Nursing. And most recently, we have an interdepartment committee that's discussing and planning for a pipeline of students from what has traditionally been underrepresented populations in nursing. So we're looking at how we can um, build relationships with schools that has underrepresented populations in nursing and be um, active with our recruitment and our retention at Quinnipiac and building that culture and that comfort of diversity and inclusivity. And connected to all of this is our philanthropic priorities. Um, let me pause first by saying Quinnipiac just a week or two ago had the New England Commission on Higher Ed um, visiting us virtually to do our own um, university-wide accreditation, which went very well. Uh, very well. And um, of course, they always find opportunities for improvement, but that's how we all improve as, as being honest with what, can, what else can we do? And what can we do better? And one of those is fundraising, because often fundraising helps us um, achieve some special things that we want to do, to, to do whether it be in, in a school or a department. So we've aligned our fundraising or our philanthropic priorities with our strategic plan. And the first, as I just mentioned, diversity and inclusivity and support for students who are being recruited and retained at Quinnipiac from underrepresented populations um, traditionally in nursing and um, student scholarships over, overall uh, for all populations and, and all types of learners, um, faculty and staff support. So those are things like professional development, for example, in simulation, getting accredited meant getting um, a broader knowledge and a deeper knowledge of simulation and the professional development that had to go on for that faculty and staff to achieve um, that excellence that we are um, doing in, um, in simulation as just one example. And there are other places, certainly faculty and staff support related to research and other um, activities that help us build the right environment and the right um, learning environment, I would say, for our students. And then our, our fourth philanthropic priority currently is about student care and creating a student care fund. Right now, we do have um, a donor who, who provides a fund for students who have emergency needs. Perhaps um, something happened personally and they couldn't meet um, making, um, uh, paying a bill related to uh, their laptop broke, as an example, and uh, things are tight at home. Um, perhaps. Um, we certainly recognize these things and we want our students to be successful and when there's financial burden that um, creates some strain for them. So we are looking to build the student care fund so that when these things occur, 
and we are, um, we've all been there and we've all had those situations where we wonder how we're going to take care of this certain situation. We want our students to be able to go to a place and find some funds to help care for them during these emergency times. An emergency is broad. It could be the smallest. It could be the, it could be a larger thing, but to that person, it's important in that moment. And that is something we're building through our philanthropic priorities and some fundraising. So moving on um, briefly, just for a few more uh, notes, uh, change gears. Lisa, you already talked about the COVID-19 and how we've managed. And so proudly we've been able to get all of our students to graduation last May. And currently, and if I could find some wood to knock on here, we're, we're plowing pretty confidently through the semester. You all know, um, certainly the university has a dashboard and we're keeping a very close eye on our COVID, COVID rates, but our student learning has not um, paused during this time. They're deeply involved in their clinicals and labs and their coursework. We're, um, dare I say, over a hump now. We're past midterm and we're doing well. And should there be any um, particular um, severe uptick at the university, we are prepared um, as safely and as appropriately as we can that our students' clinical education continue because that's important. That's important for healthcare. It's important for the workforce and our pipeline and our students want to work. They want to be in clinicals. Their best days are clinicals. I'll tell you that. They love taking care of patients and we are um, maintaining our, our, our drive and our curriculum right through um, this pandemic. And we're very proud of all of our students and all of our faculty and staff who have supported them during this, this process. So we're very pleased. And we have really struck up some extra special relationships with our colleagues in health sciences and medicine. Together, we've worked through policies and planning and talking to the healthcare institutions on what we need to keep the students safe at those sites and really have done a lot of work um, in behind the scenes, but then on a day-to-day -day basis, rolling up our sleeves and working with our colleagues and our students and finding out what they need, what's it like, and what can we do to support them. So we have managed this COVID and we're preparing for the spring semester. That announcement has just come out what the spring will look like. And we are very intentionally with our fingers crossed, hoping for a more on ground engagement, especially, especially with our traditional undergraduate program. We want them, we know this is a hands-on profession and we want them to have as much educational engagement as we can on ground safely. So the spring semester comes and they'll be moving in, in I think around the 19th of January or so. And that first week will be online as they get tested. They'll be tested before they come back to campus, get tested again when they get here. And then we'll start our on-ground engagement. I, I believe it's right around the 1st of February. And then we'll, we'll maintain our curriculum right on through. The university will plan for some wellness days midweek what would have been a, a mid-semester spring break is gone. We, will, we don't want students going off on a vacation in the middle of the semester and coming back. Um, so we'll work to give them some personal time and some wellness time and some deep breathing time somewhere in that middle of March, in the middle of the week. So they don't have a long weekend and, and go want to go home or, or go traveling and keep them safe. So we're excited about how the spring looks. Um, Associate Dean Rebeshi, she has been um, integral in the university committee on planning the spring semester. And we're starting to see that really um, come to fruition now. So that's, that's exciting there. And I guess before we open to q and I wanna hop back to our alumni. And I know, um, Patty, we have a video to show, but we did reach out to them early on in COVID and they, we sent a video out to them from all the faculty and staff in the school who just said, thank you, hope you're doing well, hope you're safe, just checking in with you. And we sent that video out to our Bobcat alums. And then the, the response back was so heartwarming and um, it just, I just got chills just now thinking about it. Um, they sent back many emails. There were phone calls, texts to some of us. It was so nice hearing them praise Quinnipiac School of Nursing and, and their education and their preparedness for what they're facing. And some actually sent us a video um, back and we would like to share that with you. And then we'll have some final thoughts. Maybe Lisa, if you have anything you wanna add or Patty, and then we can certainly open up to Q&A and just have a conversation with you. And I think we're, we're small enough if I look at our number. Um, certainly if you wanna get on camera, we can do that. 
but um, we can answer questions. We have a more intimate group here, so we'll take the last half hour to be um, kind of um, conversational. Patty, can you hit the video? <laughs> Thank you so much for doing everything you can to stay safe. Hope you are too. Thank you, Quinnipiac School of Nursing, for giving me the tools I need to help fight COVID here on the front lines. You taught me assessments, pharmacology, and how to read an ABG all in my four years at KU. But you taught me so much more than that. You taught me that nursing is an art form, how to use caring effectively, how to hold a hand, the power of it. Uh, the difference between sympathy and empathy. You taught me to be a nurse and using integrity, scholarship, and service. Although nothing could have prepared us to fight this pandemic, you and your faculty gave us the strength and the confidence to be real nurses in the real world. Just wanted to say thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. I will be forever grateful that I am a part of such an amazing community and I will always be a Bobcat. Go Bobcats. Go Bobcats. Good. Thank you, Patty. Um, Lisa, any um, other thoughts or something that maybe I missed to highlight? We want to uh, make sure we share and then we can move on to some Q&A. Um, no, I think uh, we'd love to hear from the parents that are on and uh, be able to engage in that conversation and maybe some issues, questions that you may have that we haven't spoken about this morning. So open it up to the group. Okay, we have one from Sarah. Uh, will there be any efforts for the freshmen to meet one another? They are so isolated due to COVID. Um, so we have a couple things happening here um, and I'm not sure if um, this particular student is in the living learning community, but we do have um, some folks I know are not in the living learning community that first year dorm where we have about 70 students living together. Um, the faculty who advise those students, I know they're just starting their planning now that we've gotten over this hump I mentioned earlier to do some um, sessions that all freshmen will be invited to. Um, distance, distancing of course, but more of a social event to meet some of the faculty, hear about their careers, how they got into their, their choices. They call it like a lunch and learn type of a gathering. And I know our three um, faculty, Aaron Fusco, Sheila Maloney and Peg Gray are working together to get that planning going now that we've made it through midterm week and um, they have some social events. In addition, our chief experience officer is Tom Ellett and he has a pretty aggressive um, plan and students should notice there's much, much activity happening more on campus outside right now. There are events planned um, intentionally of course, the whole safety and the six foot and the distancing and the, the mask wearing, but many events planned and some more informal for students to get to know each other better. And I think the best thing we can do um, now, because as the, as the, um, as the, um, I'm sorry, something's making a noise here um, in my, um, at my house here. <laughs> um, I lost my train of thought. Um, help me out, Lisa. I was talking about the LLC. Yeah, I, I was just going to add to that, Lisa, if you don't mind. Um, so, Sarah, I would encourage <laughs> um, uh, your um, child to connect with the QSNA mm -hmm. as well. And um, our QSNA faculty advisors are, um, and I can, we can put this in the chat for you, or Donna Diaz and Brianna Durante. Mm -hmm. But um, as I understand, when I mentioned the blanket making, we did have freshmen there, um, all nursing students. Um, the blanket making was outside. Students were socially distant as they needed to be. But it was a time, um, a good time, I think, for freshman students to meet each other. Um, and uh, we anticipate we will have other QSNA activities throughout the semester. Our uh, QSNA president, student president, Charles Sharkey, is also a good contact um, for your freshman 
um, students as well. Maybe students can reach out to him and also learn about ways to engage with other nursing students. Um, it's critically important, as you said, you know, due to, you know, the situation with um, the restrictions with COVID, it can be very isolating, especially for new students on campus. So some of these might be really good uh, strategies for them to meet other nursing students. Thank you, Lisa. We have a question here also from Maria. She has a senior and she wants to know if the school goes to status red, how will clinicals continue? I am concerned about her meeting clinical requirements for graduation and NCLEX, as well as getting the hands-on experience that she needs. Uh, Lisa Rebesha, you wanna take that? Sure. Yeah, um, that obviously is an important concern for parents, and we completely understand that. Um, so there's a lot of unknown, and I don't want to pretend to know what will happen, but certainly if the school um, goes to status red, we're already in conversations with um, the school of which programs, including nursing, would need to continue in terms of clinical practice and the hours required through accreditation and um, licensure regulation. So um, that is well known at the university. A lot of this um, you know, will also depend on the availability of the clinical sites, you know, I would, um, my concern is if the school goes to a red status and it's limit, you know, COVID is limited to the campus, but, you know, not to particular, you know, clinical agencies that we would continue to um, have students, you know, at their clinical site. Um, if there were something more significant where, you know, it's a, there's a broader implications, we will continue to collaborate and work with the State Board of Nurse Examiners as we did in the spring semester to develop the types of learning experiences that are acceptable, that are linked to particular skills and program outcomes and competencies. We had to demonstrate that in the spring with what we had planned and we'll, we'll certainly do that again. Um, so that those kinds of efforts will all be mobilized if and when that time arises. Um, and um, that's how we'll handle that within the school to, to continue to ensure students are meeting the necessary requirements and working with the organizations that dictate those requirements, if you will. Thank you, Lisa. And Trisha, um, Trisha Sharkey also wanted to know, um, she wants to know if the seniors were on schedule um, for getting prepared for the state nursing um, test after spring semester. Yes, absolutely. Our curriculum in the spring um, entails the types of courses that begin to prepare students um, very purposefully for licensure and NCLEX review. Um, so we are definitely preparing for that. Um, so one of the things that did come along this past spring um, that obviously is beyond our control in, as a nursing program or any nursing program is because of the um, social distancing requirements, the testing sites, it took longer for students, for graduates to get their um, their licensure exam scheduled. And again, because of that de-densification and the cleaning that needs to go on in between um, testers at Pearson View, which is the testing site, students were not able to get those appointments as quickly as they you know, had in the past. And so we are working again with the National Council State Boards of Nursing um, in terms of ensuring how do we get students licensed in a timely way, that's critically important. And so the National Council has been very receptive with that and adding additional testing sites. Um, and I anticipate if COVID, you know, and those restrictions that are there next summer, I'm hopeful that they will be less than they were this past summer, but if they are that we will um, be able to work together to ensure timely testing for the, for the graduates. Thank you. Lisa. Are there any other questions that anyone has?
these are really good questions. And I was just wondering and just interested if parents had any questions about PPE and the, you know, the clinical um, sites and, you know, anything around that, because, um, you know, as a parent myself, that would be certainly a concern. Um, I want to assure you, and Lisa had mentioned, um, our work across the schools of health science, medicine, and nursing. We meet um, at least once a week um, as a work group. Um, there's probably 12 or so of us across the three schools to discuss the clinical practice of our students that are engaged at various hospitals and doing everything that we need to to ensure their safety and primarily that involves the availability of PPE. So we have done, um, we've provided all of the students across the programs with face shields. We have um, fit tested on our campus, um, some of our own staff, um, Assistant Dean Fisher is one that has gotten trained in fit, fit testing. And so wearing an uh, N95 mask, for example, requires specific fit testing. It's not a one size fits all kind of thing. So we have fit tested the students that have a need to wear N95 masks. So we will continue those very aggressive measures around PPE, ensuring that the students at their clinical site are provided with the same PPE that any other healthcare provider has. And that remains of, um, a, again, uh, a high priority for us as we keep students in the clinical agencies. So their safety is you know, really at the forefront. We um, also are not assigning students per, to provide direct care for patients that are there being treated for COVID. Um, and so students are, can certainly get involved in the learning. It's critical, the learning of the care required for COVID positive um, patients, but they are not the direct care provider. Now, with that said, there's certainly, you know, someone is COVID negative this morning and, you know, is COVID positive this afternoon. And so students, you know, are caring for patients that may develop COVID. And so again, that ties into the critical need that they are protected as they need to be. Um, and again, that priority is uh, right up front and center for us in, in the school and at Quinnipiac across schools. I was just going to add there, Lisa, if I could, the university, um, given that some programs have such a need to be on ground and hands on while other programs perhaps could do a bit more online, the university is looking at different spaces that we have that have traditionally not been academic and are fitting them, if you will, to be more academic for the spring semester. So whether they might have been large meeting rooms or auditorium spaces or even large um, I say storage rooms, but these these larger places across um, North Haven in particular, um, as well as Mount Carmel campus and and making sure that we can safely um, educate our students in person on ground spread out. Um, but given that many of our learners we know are um, comfortable being more in the classroom and meeting that listening and that back and forth directly with the faculty. The university is working on that and will be working on that over, over winter break so that come February, our students will have more um, on ground engagement with their courses, um, particularly in the majors. I know for us, the junior and senior, but in the uh, underclassmen, and I don't know who around our panel today, who our participants are, who are have freshmen and sophomores, but um, you know, we'll, We'll know more um, soon into which classes are on ground. The schedule is just coming out now for the science courses and our general education courses and what's on ground and what's online. So we know that um, students um, really desire a, an on-campus experience. So we're doing what we can to do that additionally and safely. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And just to add to that in terms of our nursing labs, um, that for the spring, the planning is um, that includes that students will be on campus each week for their nursing labs. Um, and doing that again, and with the social distancing that is required, we have um, re-looked at our schedule. We are 
scheduling labs from very early in the morning till late in the evening to ensure that we have the adequate um, space and uh, uh, that's necessary to accommodate all students for weekly labs again, critical to their development of skills and competencies that they need as they progress through the program. Um, so that's, um, that's another key piece. The university more broadly has sort of classified courses into tiers and sort of related to what Dean O'Connor had mentioned and the courses that really require that physical presence of students on campus, whether that be a science lab, whether that be you know, a, a nursing lab. And so all of that categorization has occurred and the registrar's office is prioritizing those tier one types of courses for the on-ground um, presence that um, the Dean mentioned. Is there any, anything, I mean, anybody can ask us, now's your opportunity, we're here um, for you. So if there's anything at all you wanna ask us, feel free. Um, I know that um, if, you, if you don't wanna go into the chat, you can certainly find us, um, you can email us, um, either you know, lisa.rabeshi or lisa.oconnor at qu.edu, and we're happy to answer your questions. We also have a, a School of Nursing Dean's email to answer your question, should something come up in your mind after today, and it's S for school, N-U-R-S, Dean's, D-E-A-N-S, at qu.edu, and that we certainly check on a daily basis. So um, I see... Um, it's hard to tell uh, all of you who are participating because um, there's some first names, there are some last names. So we're, we're happy that you've joined us. Um, anything else coming up through the chat, Patty? Nope, I just saw that Lisa did type in the Smerdine's email so that you have it there for easy access. Great, thank you, Lisa. Good. Um, also again from Trish, she says, uh, thank you to the educators for your dedication to the students and the program. Stay well. Thank you. Truly, it is our privilege to um, educate, um, educate our students and be such an important part of their lives for four years. So we want you to know that. I, um, when I first started many years ago, my um, good colleague at the time, um, you know, I don't have children. And she said, well, you, you will have now I think it was 47 at the time. Now it's, you know, 847 or whatever for undergraduate students. So, you know, we take this job very seriously. We feel strong responsibility to them and we are um, very proud that they're, that they're amongst us and doing great things. And you should all be very proud. They're amazing, amazing, amazing human beings. And we're, we're doing good. We're doing good, all of us together. So um, thank you. Um, Lisa, anything you wanna say? No, just again, thank you for taking the time out this morning and uh, just um, everyone to uh, stay well and keep safe and take very good care of yourselves and your families. Um, it's, we know how difficult it is right now. I think we're all you know, in this together and we're all dedicated to uh, doing the best work that we can.